Welcome. This is the February 28th Open ZFS production user call. We have Rob, Andrew, Rod, myself, Michael. And on the table are some just simple topics of feature ideas we've touched on recently. And maybe we can add to the broader discussion of those, or we'll just move on. Uh, one idea was should ZFS itself have some notion of whiteout file support? And that is masking out a file in a container workload. Uh, is there anyone present who would find that useful? And I do know there are various implementations on Linux. I'll take that as a, eh, maybe. Uh, Rob, what do you know about the Linux implementations, if anything? Unmute there. I'm just looking it up and the support is for uh, uh, rename at rename white out. Just looking at the system calls for this. I felt certain there's something for FreeBSD already available. I'm totally coming in cold here, so uh, I know, likewise, no worries. Yeah, the so think about that. Um, it's come up on the container calls, and so uh, this is related, I, but yeah. not exactly. I, Go look, ahead. I understand. Look, I understand what's need. What what the ask is. I will. I will go away and find out, and if I can't be on the next call, I will um, just send you a note, Michael, um, with what I found, if I found every, anything. And so here's a secret. You can drop something into the the document here. Oh, yes, of course. And then I, I've been trying to frame it with the, the next meeting, and mm. we'll probably get to the topic even in your absence, and there's a secret of it. So, so there's that. Um, and sometimes that's union FS and there are various workarounds on different platforms, but sure. Let's, let's explore that because either there's low hanging fruit that we should pursue, or there's just a very well-established need that we should pursue regardless of how complex the answer would be. So uh, if that tickles your curiosity in any way, shape or form, let's just see where it takes us. And we had a discussion on some notion of auto creating an empty snapshot for those who are, say, running through builds or log data or something that just gets routinely institutionally wiped out on a regular basis, such that many of us have our own strategies for creating and rolling back to an empty uh, snapshot. But the idea was maybe there should be some notion of a transparent, invisible uh, automatically created data set, I mean, snapshot rather, or um, a flag to auto create one at empty or some notion of that. Any, I think Rod proposed that. So I actually want to hit up uh, Andrew and Rob for your, you know, your past situations where you've used something like that, be it for builds or logs or who knows what. Um, or you haven't done it? <laughs> Not really. I mean, for the most part, I just have snapshots being auto created on the hour. Mm -hmm. With when somebody's a, with the addition of a lot of times, somebody will go in and manually create one if they're about to do something reckless. At least if they're being good. <laughs> mm hmm. Um, but you don't find but, yourself having to empty a, a directory as quickly as possible and efficiently as possible? No. Cool. No, not usually. I mean, usually if I just need to empty a directory, eh, as long as it gets done eventually, cool. get it started and move on to something else. Because... For our listeners, doing it at the POSIX layer can be very, very slow. Have it rolling back an empty uh, snapshot can be either very fast overall, or it can be completely backgrounded and get back to work without having remnants for a while. So it's something that ZFS does really, really well. Well, to be clear, I don't, I'm not usually doing a lot on the POSIX layer. Okay, um, cool. The, uh, I mean, I do have some share, some like, NFS and SIF shares, which would be, but usually I'm not going through 
myself and manually clearing a lot on those. That would be end users of those just going in and deleting one of their files. And I'm not, you know, it gets done when it gets done. Sure. And, us and that's usually not like trying to clear out a whole terabyte large directory. That's just somebody deleting a file. Now, I'm certain there are people in this chat who's got situations that do call for that. I'll give mine in a sec. Rob, I'd love to know if you, either as a developer administrator, have had a use case in the past or present. Uh, no, I uh, maybe I just never thought of it. Um, <laughs> I'm a, still a relatively recent user in the grand scheme of things, so it's like, yeah, I'll just delete the whole thing. Um, but yes, I certainly understand why I have, you know, MKFS over a file system rather than just deleting all the things in it. So, um, yeah, I can see why... You, it can be useful. Is absent the feature is the use case, uh, or sorry, is the way, is it any more than ZFS create data set, ZFS snapshot data set at, you know, epoch, like, and then a later rollback? Like, conceptually, is that what we're talking about? I'll tell you exactly how I use it, and then I'll save Rod for last, because he he kind of kicked it off. Uh, so every... Okay. FreeBSD has build options, meaning you can say, hey, don't build it without... Uh, build it without, say, VI, or without V6 networking. And uh, someone was stepping through those manually, which is a ridiculously slow process. And I'm really not worried about a developer breaking without VI, the text editor. Mm -hmm. So I found that you can turn off everything. And in doing so, by building with a few things, you generally weed out breakage. Well, I do that weekly every time release engineering spits out a snapshot and I just kick it off and say, okay, go through all the branches, uh, update the source, nuke the object directory back to empty and kick off the build. And it takes just a few minutes per per branch because everything's turned off. So I do exactly what you described, create it, snapshot it at empty, or I like your name, epoch there, uh, do my build and then dispose of the object directory the moment I know if I've succeeded or failed because I do not care about. And I will actually never use those objects for an installation as purely to see if they successfully built. So there's my use case. Uh, cool. uh, and so what we're saying, so so I, I mean, I understand what, like, obviously you can do it, that's fine. But this is, so we're talking about, if CFS made this snapshot magically under the hood, then you wouldn't, someone wouldn't realize in the future, no, oh, I wish I could just empty this out kind of easily. Oh, um, so or it's, if I forgot to, it's like, yeah, I'm kicking myself in the pants. Like, damn yes, it. So, no, it's, no, no, so no. it's entirely... If, if, maybe if ZFS right. makes it under the hood, it would appear in the .zfs directory. It would still appear. Well, it de de depends so on what kind be... of... Depends on what kind of under the hood. Um, but yeah, like... But no, you would, you would want it to appear in the .zfs directory. And that would that would give people awareness that this thing exists. I actually, I also, I like the idea of calling it epoch instead of the, I use empty, but but epoch yeah. is probably a yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't to me. It doesn't seem like a huge lift to do it because it's empty. It shouldn't. Um... Is that true? No, I'm just trying to think if there's a cost. So, Rod, what's the motivation to it, see there it? There is. I mean, there's always a cost in any rollback operation stuff. For one, you're going to have to free up a whole bunch of file system blocks and stuff. You're going to free up a bunch of ZFS. Oh, oh yeah. No, sorry. There's the cost. The, there's the cost. There's the cost if you use it. If you don't use it, like like if ZFS did it like automatically, oh, quietly, okay. by default, uh, I'm just trying to think what would the cost be? Well, I mean, because... snapshots are supposed to be really cheap, so I mean... And, and it's an empty snapshot. I'm just trying to think is... I kind of remember... Like, I've only just woken up, so I'm a little bit yeah. foggy still. Um, yeah, the, the, um, is, there, is, there, is there the the gap between the empty and what we have now? There's, 
like is it going to keep it there anyway otherwise it's a flag um but it would be cool if if it could be on all if it could just be always available even if it's not visible um if it could be always available internally that I think would you, be you, you, great. You, um, you almost have to make it visible because whatever name you're going to use for it has to be a name that the, that the user can use in rollback and other commands. And so if it weren't visible, it would be what happens if a user tries to create a snapshot by that name? Yeah, if it wasn't visible, maybe you'd give it a different, uh, like a different special character in front of it or or whatever. I, I mean, I'm not I'm not saying it, it should or shouldn't be visible. I'm just thinking about different ways. Oh, yeah, to, brainstorming here. And to, uh, what if you to, realize it is I mean, a it's value clutter, you want to agreed, clutter? It, it clutters a, a ZFS list dash T snapshot or T all. I mean, it does clutter the list up, but hey, yeah. most people that are using snapshots to any extent have such a huge snapshot list. It's I not, mean, it's, it's in it's the true, noise. It? Um, but the, the, the uh, to explain one of the use cases for it, and Dan hit on this right away, is that there is a difference between doing a ZFS destroy file set and a ZFS rollback to at empty, mm. in that if you destroy it and recreate it, a whole bunch of other things happen, like unmounting, you have to you have to mount it. And also, you've just lost all the special information you may have created that data set with. And you may or may not know what all that special information Those is. Those properties. Maybe, yeah, the properties. And Good you point. Say, I forgot about that. Yeah, you're going to have to go back and reset all the properties to what you want on it. And the, the rollback to add empty obliterates all of those concerns. You just, you're going to get rid of all the data inside the snapshot and do so quickly. Without an unmount and a mount, yeah, which, really which, nice. which which means you can have a process sitting in the directory, for example, <laughs> and it's hmm. not going to get it doesn't get hung up by the fact that there's a process sitting there. It's just all the files disappear out from under it. What happens to files that it has open? Do they just uh, they, di they disappear when they, they sort of they I leave, but they I'm disappear when all. I'm I'm not certain that that doesn't cause the rollback to fail if you have a file open. Yeah. Like I think if your if your process is actually in a in a subdirectory of the mount point and you do this, you get a a, a busy error. The file that's nothing new, right? Yeah, that's that's not a that's, new. That's fair. I'm just trying to get a, a since since we're talking about this as sure. like a a sort of proxy for. You know, a fast way to delete all your files. Um, I'm just thinking about desirable or not parallels with that. And like, obviously, I can delete a file that is open and it still exists, but is not visible in the uh, file yeah, system hierarchy. Yeah. And it's just whether you would expect that to continue or not. Um, which sounds like not, I'm just thinking through other possible. I, I would need to do the experiments because I do not know what happens if you do a ZFS rollback with a file open on the data set. Whether yeah, the rollback would... operation fails or whether you simply retain pointers to the data blocks and they get freed when you close the file. That's a good question. I'll have a quick look. I I'm Maybe... pretty I think you get a busy file system if you try and do a rollback with an open file in it. It would not surprise me. And I think that's probably appropriate too. Right. No um, surprise yeah. there. But yeah, let's figure that one out. Uh just a naive question. Could this be done with a bookmark? Or I don't um, even know what bookmarks are. It's a, uh, it's sorry, like just, a just go ahead, Robin. Go ahead and explain it in your terms. He's muted. Oh, he's, he's got, got someone something. interrupting him. He's reaching yeah. over his shoulder. So we'll give him a sec. Um a a bookmark. I've come up. I've started using another one to the since you brought the issue up about what happens to submounts and and that kind of stuff. And and I now have another common snapshot I'm creating called template, which is one step. It's one step beyond epoch empty in it. Um, if it has submounts in it, I create 
the directories for those mounts and then make a new snapshot that's the template point so that I don't lose sub mounts. I don't I don't I'm not rolling it back before the sub mounts existed. Oh, to preserve sub mounts, you said? Yeah, to preserve the directories of the sub mounts. So, so uh, while you're throwing that out there and Rob's getting back to us, I have been just a, configuring a system that I absolutely know I will be throwing packets at uh, packages at repeatedly. So I just, you know, have a fresh snapshot and just do a rollback and reboot. And that's been extremely helpful. But Rob, do you have a definition of a bookmark? Uh, are you muted? Um, a, a bookmark is a it's 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 effectively a marker in time um uh not not time but actually transaction id um which is effectively time because they just roll forward um and basically I, you can replicate with it right but you don't have the uh, this, the 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 contents of a snapshot to roll back to. You simply have increments, is my understanding, because I've not really used them in. Uh, yeah, and hang on, I, I asked this I question. It's those. it's. I know what it is, but I can't remember exactly the right way to think about it. But I did have a conversation with someone recently where we worked it out. <laughs> um, and I will. Because I had asked someone. It almost from I just went and took a quick read. It almost looks like it's just a fucking alias for a snapshot. But it's uh, without so the data you can roll back to, is my understanding. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. It's just a um. Yeah. It's a it's a transaction ID. So so every. I mean, I don't see any differentiation between a snapshot and a bookmark. The only way you no, can create a, the no, only way you can create a bookmark is by referring to a snapshot. But then you can delete the snapshot, and all the data with the snapshot goes yeah. away. So a a snapshot is like oh. like we take a, not not a copy, but we kind of take a take a pointer to the complete uh you know the complete tree that makes up the data set, and kind of ref not it's not a ref count but effectively kind of ref count the entire thing so it exists it's real and that's why it costs you space um because it's like a real complete file system or volume captured at a point in time that you can roll back to a bookmark is just you know number 23 so it's just a point in time and so any block that is like any block that's created, every block carries a birth time on it. So right. if you have a, if you had a bookmark at transaction 23, and then you said, I want to do an incremental replication from there, that would be every block that was created after 23. So I could don't have to send the ones before 23. And that's all. So you still have to have all the other stuff. On the and other side. Yeah. Um and and then um and then it's used with like I think that the probably the big semantic difference is that if you in in a snapshot when you create a snapshot anything deleted after the point in time when you created that snapshot still exists in the snapshot. That's right. But when you create a bookmark Anything that was deleted after the, you created that bookmark that existed before that bookmark disappears from the bookmark. That's right. Okay, so that's the semantic difference. Yeah. Snap snapshots retain prior data. Bookmarks do not. Yeah. Okay, I get it. And yeah, you so can they, replicate based on them. Is that accurate? Um, you can't replicate you, a bookmark. You can't replicate a bookmark, but you can use them as a marker for. Um, incremental for resume incremental because you can say because they're a point in time that said so, so they can say everything before or after this um yeah so you can't send based on them but you can resume based on them? no you, you can send based on them. okay got it can yes, be used as the incremental source for a zfs send got it thank I, you yeah it can be used it can be used as the 
uh, the start for the send, not the end of the send. Interesting. For, the, for an incremental send. Ah, okay. Mm. At least that's my understanding. Yeah, I think, yeah, reading this care more carefully, I think that's implied. It's not... It's... Well, the, the, the documentation is very, like, correct yeah. if you get all the implications kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, will, I, I will be honest. I have always found the uh, um, bookmarks to be confusing, so... Likewise. <laughs> the main... well, I understand better now, though. What they're just really—they literally are a transaction yeah. ID. Yeah, they could really use someone actually spending the time just sitting and playing around and trying some different ideas and and like writing a nice, you know, it's a very nice blog post or possibly even a paper. Like, what the hell is a bookmark? Um, the yeah, other thing that for? a Clara article. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll throw it on my pile of things. Um, <laughs> The 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 other thing that they're then used with is um uh like redacted send. Um and what that what that is is basically once you've got the bookmark object, because it is an object, you can then attach some metadata to it that describes uh, essentially other options for the send, and that's where the redaction list is sort of stored. So it's like, when we send from this bookmark, modify the send process in this way. Um, but it's not a real thing. Uh, it's just a, like, it's almost like extra, com like a config file. <laughs> um, in that respect, it's not a file, it's, yeah. So it's it's kind of, it's very weirdly constructed. Like, I don't know that, if I was doing redacted send, I'm not sure that's how I'd do it, but, hmm. And don't get me wrong, redacted send sure sounds like the whiteout we mentioned earlier, where you simply say, ignore this little file that has their credit card information, or I think that was the original kind of use case for it. Yeah, I believe hmm. so too. Hmm. Um, and that's, I've been thinking a little bit about, um, not very much, but uh, people have talked about, it'd be good if they could remove like remove things from old snapshots. Um, Indeed. And the way I, uh, the vague way I might do that might be a similar concept. So you have something that is, it would be more at the snapshot level than the, than like the bookmark level, because it would not just be about sending. It would be, but essentially you delete the, you find the file or whatever, the object in the old snapshot, you free the blocks, and uh, also you free the free the DVAs. So the blocks remain, but they kind of have these dangling pointers to, to positions on disk. And then you have additional information that describes that, that basically says the system. When you see that, don't freak out when you can't actually read it because it, it's okay. <laughs> Someone did something. And then that becomes kind of like a sort of some annotation that is then added to the snapshot. Um, and then we'd have to get, you know, all the tools would have to understand it. The stream format would have to understand it. So it like, it is a big undertaking, but that's probably how I'd put it together. So you get that space back, but you have something that describes why the old snapshot now looks weird. Um, I can tell you what I've done. <laughs> uh, when you, when you have a year <laughs> of retention and you have a giant ISO file directory, that's just a whole bunch of baggage that's taking up space you don't want. Mm. Uh, what I did was duplicate the, uh, the the snapshot names. I think I even mounted and removed or some craziness and then R synced over the contents and preserved simply the snapshot name with its date stamp and had a kind of hillbilly uh, replacement missing the ISOs. I have a script to do it, but there's <laughs> got to be a better way. But it worked. It worked. Anyway, uh, on this topic, um, Rod, I sure like your notion of a a template, which, again, an, an administrator can implement all this, you know, on their own. But it's still handy to have uh, some yeah, amount these of are, perhaps tooling under the hood that just streamlines it or say, co covers are, your behind if you forget to do it. Go ahead, Rod. Yeah, these are all completely doable today. You just, it's a matter of administratively knowing that these are things that you might want, like, you know, 
empty and template and epoch and and just they, they almost they almost belong in a blog post and a and or a useful ways to use zfs snapshot thing somewhere is it um because the other one i i haven't done it but i could do it when i create new boot environments i could actually clone my add empty of my current recursively clone my add empty because it has all the hierarchy in it and i get all my nice properties and everything on all the the data sets already and then um i'm gonna think about that what what does that mean long term other than it's it's tied back to those data sets, so I can't remove them without promoting. Well, that's what that, yeah, that's just another, just, just clone it and then promote it. But I like your thinking. This is all ridiculously useful once you realize what you can do and what headaches it can save. So, uh, just keep the ideas coming. We, nothing has to hit like you know code or design, but just yeah, even simple user space tooling to assist is always yeah. Helpful. And I think that's a real thing whether they're whether they're in the ZFS tools properly or well known user space tools. It's kind of none of this stuff is very discoverable. Like yes, if you combine these seven building blocks in this way, yeah. you will you know now it's a car, but. <laughs> If you wrote um, these components, you'll probably have very clever use of them. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks, I, Matt. I, that's, that's not very fair. Yeah. Um, I wonder if in Lua channel programs, you could have this functionality that, hey, sorry, every time I create a data set, I get an epoch uh, snapshot, hypothetically. Yeah. I have no idea. That is a very, very unexplored space, but um, I can certainly imagine um you have a you have a program that you load in um that could respond to event triggers or something like that so you say when when this thing happens i mean well you could do it two way one is to load the channel pro to have the channel program that create essentially a script hmm. but yep glorified script yes i suppose but it's slightly different but yeah but if you could actually load a lua program in that was like a trigger, like a database trigger when this data set's created, also create the snapshot. Where do channel um, programs live, if I may? Uh, on hang on, they're they're on disk. They're loaded with the ZFS channel command, and then they are in the kernel. The whole Lua interpreter is in the kernel. But they're in the POSIX level, or they're hiding in, in behind the scenes in the I don't know, ZFS. Low level, uh, level, they're they're in yeah they're 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 not in the posits level. They are that okay. So that's to my point that well, if we do have a little hillbilly tooling, it could mm. hide there and kind of pretend we have that functionality. And maybe that is the best place. Hypothetically, yeah, and that could be that could be a good place to extend some of that stuff. Um, in fact, most of the reason it exists right now is my my understanding, because no one really knows anything about it, is simply that uh, like doing a ZFS list and then piping something and then doing a, say, an operation or whatever is a lot of round trips in and out of the kernel and a lot of taking and dropping locks that becomes very slow. So to be able to put that in a command and say, do it, do this in the kernel and do it with a single lock acquisition, um, you remove all of that cost. So but it was pretty much written for that specific purpose. And then the idea being that it could be extended later, which it never was. Um, to our knowledge. So, yeah, um, if if we found fun and interesting cases for it, that would be really cool. I'm, I have no particular, I'm personally of the position that like it's having a whole lure interpreter there kind of unmaintained is a bridge too far and we should remove it. But um but that's because no one else has turned up with a use case. So uh, maybe that's how it wins. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to remove it. And I have no actual power to do anything, I should add. Um, <laughs> I just have opinions. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's really interesting. Write that down.
And our friends in FreeBSD land have, I believe, two or three Lua interpreters in base. And it's like, okay, which, <laughs> which one? Um, there's Lua in the bootloader and there's Flua, which is used for the testing infrastructure, I believe. Yeah. And then there is also a Lua import. So there's three, there is three of them. Um, I love the fact that we brought up those topics for future highlighting and maybe we do have guests out there who can chime in and say hey yeah i'm doing some kick butt things so i'll try to reach out on that among in my circles. i i would love to hear from anyone who has even played with lua channel programs um as far as i can tell it doesn't exist so if someone's actually doing something cool i would really love to see it I second <laughs> <that>. <laughs> okay yeah. well Anything it's one of those else? Things that that when I saw it, it's like, oh, this is interesting, yep. and then never thought about it again. Yep, right. exactly. Same with bookmarks. It's like, oh, we have that, and even the full pool checkpoint, which is pretty obvious what it does, but I don't think people have really gone wild with that. You can mm. basically snapshot the entire pool and roll back after a low-level update. I believe even with feature flags enabled, etc. So it's a powerful, crazy tool that not many even know about. Anything else, or shall we just call it short and sweet? <coughs> I, well, thank I was just saying, I don't have anything else, but I could show something. Sure, if, absolutely. If you, would like. you want to share your screen? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, one sec. I'm just sure I don't have anything incriminating anywhere. Okay. Um. There we go. Let's uh, let's just share the whole thing because I don't know what's just going to. Do. All right, we can all see that. Yep. It's a bit small, but not too uh, small. Let me try this. Looks good for me. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Uh, Our YouTube audience, go ahead. <laughs> let's make it a little smaller. So this is something I'm playing with very slowly in my spare time. Which doesn't exist. Uh, I was well, welcome to the club on that. <laughs> uh, can I go run? I think I'm so long ago. There we go. Can I go run example um, pull list? All right, I've updated my. I, I have no plans to demo this, so I've updated my Rust since I last did this. So it's like, hey, look, everything's new. Let's recompile. Uh, so cool. You get to watch a. A rust build it won't take long <laughs> um what i what i'm playing with here is i um i don't really so this is my equivalent of uh zip pull list um i don't love the i don't love Z libzfs which is the thing that the uh uh pull uh sorry all the the z pool and zfs and whatever commands are built on um because it's very it's diff it's actually i don't think it's some very well designed api which is not really a criticism it's grown over many many years and that's okay um but also as we know it's very like it's very hard to get certain information out like if you want to find out what the pool status is you have to you know grip things out of z pool status or you you know you have to you have to build your tools by gripping this output and that makes things like quite inflexible for people writing those programs who um, need to deal with formats and all the rest, and, and layouts and spaces and everything else. It makes things quite difficult for programmers because that means that that is now our API. We can't change those things without breaking downstream tools. So this is why you want a real API. And a lot of people have been doing things with Rust um, and I've been dabbling with Rust uh, for a few years. Um, and I thought, well, what if I wrote not wrappers around libzfs, but I actually wrote a replacement for libzfs and tools with that. So it talks directly. So this is, um, it's really just playing around. I'm not going to take you through code, um, but this is calling directly into like through devzfs, like into the kernel to do things like zpool list. Uh, um, so these are just example programs. Um, 
you know, uh, list of list of data sets. Um, that's pretty. But but these pro yeah, so that's just using like an off the shelf Rust uh, table printer thing. But what I really wanted to be able to do was build uh, like dashboards and 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 like basically lift it into my lift live ZFS data into like UI programs. So I'll show you this one. Um, which well, because I'm not doing anything. Does this is this second window on screen? Yes. Uh, yep. Cool. So if I just um, if I just so this is that's Zpool IOStat basically. Um, that is showing bandwidth read and write up the top. So if I start a scrub, this is just on my laptop, but if I start a scrub and I'll have to do that, and then I'll have to do that, um, you'll see, you know, we suddenly start, we suddenly start doing a lot more reads. Okay. Um, if you've got multiple pools, this will actually show multiple pools. Um, so yeah, now like, these are just toys, and this thing is like about two percent of what it would actually need to be. But the idea is that, you know, a lot of people are, are dabbling with Rust at the systems level for writing tools, for writing all sorts of interesting stuff, and to be able to programmatically say, um, like, yeah, get me, get me. Um, well, I mean, what do I even do? What uh, I will, I will, for the programmers in the room, I will show a tiny bit of this. Um, it's not even particularly right code yet, but you know, for what's easy is ZFS open. So open the thing for each pool, for each data set. And then this is part of the table builder stuff. So you don't like, it's not, you wouldn't actually be this complicated to do a real thing, but we go data set, you know, get property S I'm pulling the properties out of, uh, out of this list. Um, and setting it up. So the idea being, you can just write a regular program and treat a data set or a pool or whatever as an object. Um, and you don't have to worry about formatting or whatever, you just get ints back. And that's all. What that's does all. this mean for JSON output for your mention of a dashboard? Um, well, you could write, um, like if I, do you effortlessly bolt on JSON support, which is currently, I believe, a project at Claire, if I'm not mistaken? Yes. Yeah, so, like, what this would be, if you did it this way, I'm surprised it doesn't work. Do I have to give it an arg? That doesn't matter. It's a dumb program. No um, <laughs> uh, what about LiveXO, even though I realize we have a language difference? That's Sorry, say that again? LiveXO on FreeBSD handles... Uh, some of that yeah uh, right so so like we could embed uh so if, if you were using this you just add rust json stuff you could okay. embed libxo into the current zfs tools i believe that actually exists out there it just um upstream was not entirely keen on it but it was before my time um but it's sort of it's orthogonal to this um yes i would like that too i'm not saying i'm not saying that i am going to rewrite the entire ZFS user space or anything. This is a toy. I just wanted to show it because um, particularly like the the graphing stuff, like there's no, the idea that you could actually write a program and say, I'm going to write a program that is specific to ZFS and I don't have to do all this in a real program language and I don't have to do kind of jumping around to try and figure out how to parse the output of the ZFS command or whatever. Like that is appealing to a lot of programmers and i wonder if part of the reason that there is um kind of a dearth of interesting zfs programs uh is because of the difficulty in interfacing to it it feels very much like and i don't mean this disparagingly but it feels very much like a sysadmin world and that's the thing i very much found when i when i came here it, it's not very obvious what to do if you're coming in as a programmer before a sysadmin. And I wonder if a that's lot, I think where a, a bit of a gap of, is. I think a lot of this comes from the earlier days of it. A lot of the, a lot of the ZFS and the Zpool tools were really written to be looked at by people, not by the machine. Yeah. So they, they don't, they really do not. Uh, export very nicely into a format that's easily parsed. Yeah. 
And, and I agree. Like yeah. And I agree. Um, you know, the world that came with you, you know, you had a few machines and a human was running them. But now when you got, you know, a thousand of the damn things, um, it's uh it's yeah, it's it needs different Rob different how does this relate at all to Matt's rust proof of concept of a I believe Zpool command at the developer summit? I have no idea. I've never seen. Do this. reach out um, to him. Reach out to Matt I, Aaron's. He'd love to tell you more about it. Hit him on Slack and uh, do. All uh, right. Do, please do not duplicate efforts. He banged no. out a proof of concept, as you All have right. done. Anyway, I will. I will link that for anyone who wants it. But yeah. And that's really um, thank you. Uh, there's some output from you in chat above this. Is that something the world needs to see? Uh. Oh, I could probably have pasted it into the doc. That is um, a rollback with a file open. Um, oh. oh, hello. And, uh, yes, for actually, while, while while actively writing to the file, Ooh, and uh, okay, and it it worked in that it immediately um, it looks like it closed the file <laughs> and returned it. Uh, it returned an I/O error to the right, and then did the rollback. Yeah. Um, I wonder okay. what happens what happens to a file handle held open for read. Do you get do you get I mean you just have it you just, you're just holding on to it but you're not actively reading from it. Um and Yeah, if you were just holding it open I'm not sure because there's no operation there but that like that was a that was a write which was the most yeah. aggressive thing, thing to do. Um but I suspect the same thing happens on the read case. What happened? You, you have it held open, and then the next time you mm. execute a read, um, you're going to get a, a mm. IO error. That's oh, that's actually oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, that's interesting because the file descriptor is bound to essentially an inode in the kernel and inside the uh, the inode and xenode bridge for zfs is pretty much just the inode is mapped to an object uh, a data set id and an object id if you've done the rollback the data set and the data set and the object id are the same no the data set id isn't oh is it ah oh, bugger yeah okay that could get really weird really quick i hope it just closes <laughs> I hope it just it off. Just, I, well, you're not. You're going to get an I/O error. I think I'm almost positive what'll happen. Mm, I I feel fairly certain based on what I've what I saw there. I can yeah. kind of imagine how it's written, and I feel like the easiest and dumbest way to do it would be to just EIO everything. Um, but yeah, anyway, that did surprise me <laughs> a little. So, but yeah, I wouldn't feel like you'd ever want to rely on that in any useful way. Mm. Well, thank you for checking that. Uh, John, welcome. I didn't see a slip in. And we went through a discussion of some notion of an, an app em at empty or at epoch uh, snapshot either created with your own tooling or possibly something under the hood or possibly something in channel programs. Then Rob gave his demo of a rest Rust-based uh, zpool command that's uh, that i sincerely hope you'll compare it to uh matt's work and we'd love to know if you have created something awesome with say channel programs in lua in your environment and you're muted if you're trying to talk to us or you've got a colleague in your office the the proposal that I read did not specifically say Lua. It just said scripting language. Oh, so channel programs can be anything? Again, I've only heard what I've heard. Oh, it's a proposal, so they haven't oh. decided on those details of implementation. Hmm. I mean, is this a, a existing feature that's working in ZFS? Because what I read was a proposal. I think at this point, channel programs were added and they at least the documentation I thought saw, I thought was specifically Lua. Okay. I may have been, I probably was reading earlier documentation because it was just calling a, a proposal. Hence the need for a, a few more details from someone using it in anger. So, okay. Uh, John, you got anything or are you tied up and we'll just call it good? I just, 
had some extra time, so thought I'd log in and uh, be a fly on the wall. Welcome. So yeah, uh, hopefully you heard my summary of what we've done. You can read the doc. Mm -hmm. And have you used channel programs by chance? Um, if you mean many years ago on the mainframe, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. modifying yeah, they channel hijacked programs and uh, channel status word and start IOs and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, great <laughs> answer. Sorry. Um, do you have any use cases for rolling back to either an empty data set or a templated data set? And you know, we've each come up with our own tooling to do that. And the brainstorming was should should ZFS itself hypothetically have some notion of an auto created epoch snapshot that one can roll back to efficiently. And should that so, be listed? Should it not be? Should it, you know, we're just brainstorming here. <laughs> I will, I'll be very specific because the answer is yes. Um, for the work that I do that you know some of from the from the Beehive yep. uh, meetings, when I generate a VM, whether it be a local storage or remote storage, um, I generate the data set that's in use and I immediately snapshot it and give it a name of empty. Oh, there you go. So you're doing it too. You do the same thing I do. Uh -huh. And, and then when someone tells me that, you know, okay, and, and actually this is not just me, it, this is an automated process, but um, when someone wants to blow that VM away and they want to load some of something else up or what have you, um, I don't have to get rid of the data set. I don't have to go through the databases and mess with anything. I just take that particular data set and I issue a rollback to the empty uh, data set. Um, the only other particularly special name I use is I also have a data set, um, that after something is, is generated, um, I have a recursive cloud init, uh, process I use for generating VMs from an install to a usable state. And the very last state recreates, it re-enables cloud init and then snapshots itself with the name cloud init. And a user can then roll back their own VM to CloudInit, at which point they feed it a CloudInit file, and it'll automatically come back up and they can reinitialize. Um, and in the development community, they absolutely love this because it gives them a completely automated, scriptable uh, mechanism to take systems that have been in use, roll them back, retry a process, and, and continue. And they can do that across, you know, and number of systems in parallel. So you asked me a very specific question about empty, and the answer is I do, and I actually do use the I use data sets as a as a major feature in the Beehive environment that I support. That's exactly it, and I found even for just a a Windows software installation on a Windows virtual machine, uh, mm -hmm. I of course snapshot even before the first boot when it gets. Uh, when settings are applied and I do it at each step, but even for an application upgrade, uh, install the old version, install the old data, uh, install the new version, which updates it, export the SQL database. That's the actual data roll mm -hmm. back to completely uninstalled, install the fresh version of the software, fresh version of data. And you achieve a like clean installation that would have otherwise been impossible. So, so it sounds like, it sounds behind. like a, a different process but very similar in in thought thought mechanism the this recursive mechanism that i have with cloud init um i can actually take a vm and roll it back to a because i have about a half a dozen states in there for the prep mm -hmm. and i can roll it back to one of them and reapply the setup cloud init and it will actually pick up from whichever the last cloud init that is a, it, at the top of the stack nice um yeah, anything for automation, anything. This could use any and all highlighting by users because they're such useful, powerful features. I'm just saying. So, well, thank you. Um, I will punch your notes up to the above where we discussed that. And if you have anything else, speak now or forever hold your peace. And uh, otherwise, I say we call it. Grab your snapshots and head for the door.
Yep. Oh, uh oh, did you just come up with a clever ending of these? Okay, so let's snapshot it and leave. <laughs> and snapshot and head for the door. Okay. If if ZF if if they were to implement a the concept of an empty snapshot, and it, you know, obviously I, I hope something like that might be optimized. Uh but yeah, I would I would probably pick that up pretty quickly. So think about the criteria there. Uh, you know, for some of us, it's just a quick, reliable, empty. The other is preserving a whole lot of uh, properties that are maybe difficult or even impossible to recreate. So that's huge. Well, exactly. Helpful. That's why I said I don't like to go through yeah. the process of destroying a data set mm -hmm. and then recreating it and exactly. having to go back through the databases to recreate whatever state the the developer slash user has has set for this thing through the through automation. Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, of course. So yeah, do keep have that in the back of your head because um we're probably missing some you know future clever usage and way to implement this elegantly that solves yet more problems. So anyway. Well, thanks, gang. Uh, do your snapshots, uh, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in a week. See you later. later.